Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference overview of SMT. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and send. With that, I'll turn the call over to Elizabeth Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the APHIS BS Training, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Fina Diaz. Dr. Diaz obtained her doctorate in veterinary medicine at the University of Cordoba in Spain in 2000. She has a very long um, experience with FMD. Um, she came to the United States as a postdoctoral fellow at the, at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center, Agricultural Research Service, to work with Dr. Marvin Grubman in the development of strategies to control and eradicate FMD virus. After five years, she became a USDA research microbiologist to extend her work in FMDV countermeasures with great contributions to the field, including the use of bovine interferon lambda to protect against FMDV and the breakthrough, the optimization technology to develop modified live attenuated FMD vaccines. In 2018, Dr. Diaz joined the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service as a microbiologist to coordinate the transboundary animal disease repository team of the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, performing genomic characterization of viral agents and developing the Rindipest virus consolation plan. Recently, she has transitioned to the Foreign Animal Disease Research Unit, ARS of USDA, as a veterinary medical officer to lead her own team to carry out basic and applied research in veterinary immunology related to the mechanisms involved in pathogenesis and host response to infection and vaccination of foreign animal diseases, such as foot and mouth disease and African swine fever. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Diaz. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Liz, for the invitation. So as it has said before, today I'm going to talk about my old friend, foot and mouth disease. So foot and mouth disease is actually um, a very old disease, it's been with us for hundreds of years. The first episodes describing uh, this disease happened in 1500s in Italy. And this, uh, this person, Fracastorius, who is considered the father of uh, epidemiology, started noticing that were uh, happening uh, similar events in cattle in different close by location so the cattle showed similar clinical signs. And he has some uh, written description of what he was observing. And from then until the late 19th century, this disease has been a part of, of, a, of the culture of people who, who got livestock. That's Back in, in 19th, 19th century, when the gem theory was well established by Pasteur and Cox, two other researchers at the time, Friedrich Lofer and Paul Frosch, identified the virus for the first time as a filtrable agent. So they, would, they were able to get samples from an animal, filter that, and expose another animal, and the animals got sick. So they had identify the infectious agent causing the disease without really knowing that it was a virus then. And then uh, in the past, the importance of this disease was not recognized by livestock, livestock owners because this is a, a disease that in the acute phase uh, causes the vesicular lesions and some loss in production in the animals, but the animals don't die and they recover. So it's only at the beginning of the last century that a full economic importance of the disease received proper consideration because it was uh, realized then that it's one of the most contagious diseases on livestock and um, it can really affect the economy of a country in case of having it present. 
So who is uh, causing food and mouth disease? If it's caused by food and mouth disease virus, FMDV. This virus belongs to the Picornaviridae family. Uh, it's a very small virus. Actually, Picorna means very small. Uh, it's it's a part of the Astrovirus genus, and for the longest time was the only virus in that genus. Although, very recently, in the last in the last 20 years, another one virus was included in the same genus, equine rhinitis A virus. Sudama disease virus is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. It's non-enveloped, and its genome is very small. It's only around 8,500 bases RNA, of RNA. And uh, um, those, uh, this uh, genome is uh, encoding for four structural proteins, DP1, 2, 3, and 4, and 11 non-structural proteins that are important for different aspects of viral translation and transcription. And then it has um, some non-coding regions in the flanking uh, uh, untranslated regions of the virus, 5 and 3 prime UTR that are also important in different aspects of transcription and translation. So this virus, since it's very small and the genome is very small, every single part of that genome is essential or not essential but very important for viral replication and full virulence of the virus. So um, since it's a RNA virus, uh, the polymerase from RNA viruses are prone for mutation, and that's very important because that's uh, causing that there is a high variability on this virus. There are seven recognized serotypes, O, A, C, and South African territories, one, two, and three, and then Asia. But within each serotype, there are numerous strains or also called genotype or topotypes, depending on what is used for their characterization. And it's based on the sequence of one of the structural proteins, VP1. And why is this so important, the serotypes and the genotypes and topotypes? It's important because in terms of vaccination and protection, there is not a great cross-protection among serotypes, for sure, and even between subtypes within the same serotype. So that's very important uh, to understand and try to uh, design eradication plans. So you have to know what viruses, viruses are circulating at a given region. And also other uh, important things to consider about why all of this virology knowledge is important in terms of uh, diagnostic and protection and eradication. So diagnostics take advantage of this genome and the associated proteins from it. So knowing the serotype by studying the sequence of the BP1 uh, will allow you to to uh, diagnose the virus and design vaccines better. There are ELISAs that have been uh, developed to target structural and non-structural proteins, and that's important because you could differentiate between infected and vaccinated, vaccinated animals. Infected animals should develop a antibodies against non-structural proteins because at, at one given point of viral replication, those proteins are going to be exposed to the host and the host are, is going to develop antibodies against that versus vaccinated animals typically do only develop uh, antibodies against a structural protein or there are vaccines that have a specific DIVA markers. Then with a, knowing the, the viral sequence and have developing different PCR uh, 
diagnostic tools can help to diagnose as a general SMDV, but can also help to determine what is the serotype, the topotype involved in a particular outbreak. And that's also why you use sequencing, to be able to, to identify what is the virus circulating. So uh, FMD is a reportable disease to the OIE, and every six months, OIE members have to report the FMD status, and the OIE generates these uh, maps to have uh, inform the public what is the situation. So this, uh, in particular, is a screenshot of the last uh, map generated in June of this year. And <clears throat> as you see, um, unfortunately for this one, there is a, a lot of unreported uh, situation throughout the world, except for the countries that are free. And then one important change from previous years is that uh, South Africa has become uh, FMD infected. So it, it has lost the FMD free status from uh, 2019. So the OIE offers this World Animal Health, has of opened this World Animal Health information system in which uh, they have real-time updates, real-time meaning every six months updates, uh, to report what, what is the situation with foot and mouth and many of other infectious diseases throughout the world. So to give you an example on how the situation is changing, this is the screenshot of, of what happened between January and June of 2019. You see all of the countries in, in green are free, but we have a lot of countries like China, Korea, eh, Morocco in Africa, and many other African countries in red, so meaning they are going through an outbreak. Some of the countries, like the orange one, is disease is suspected. So they create these different categories to characterize the eh, status of each uh, country in the world. And then when we move to the next second part of the year, the map is significantly changed. Some countries now appear as free when they were not free before. Some of the countries did not report for the second part of the year, but the OIE makes a great effort to keep this updated, and it's very important to avoid um, outbreaks in FMDV-free countries. Uh, so another impo important aspect of the world situation for this disease is the circulation of the different uh, serotypes in the affected areas. So it's, it's rare, almost impossible to consider that only one serotype is circulating if an area is affected by the virus. So and um, depending on the region of the world, um, the vir circulating virus are grouped by what they call pools. So actually, in this uh, moment, there are seven pools throughout the world, and these are um, the colors that you have on the legend of, of this uh, slide. And then in this circle, um, circle diagram that you see on top of the region, you can see what are the serotypes that are affecting the area. So typically three, but you have some areas where you can see diagnosed up to five uh, serotypes in the same area. And the important thing about this map is there are many descriptions now in the last uh, five to ten years of serotypes that are doing like translational movements from one uh, pool to another pool. So in other words, they, they are moving through the different regions of the world. And that can generate problems because um, areas that are affected with SMD typically run vaccination campaigns, and those campaigns uh, focus on developing the vaccines 
towards the stereotypes that are circulating in the region. So if all of a sudden you have a, a new stereotype in the region, you are going to start having a lot of uh, small outbreaks or animals that are not protected with vaccination. So the vaccine strategy would be have to change right away to cover the new stereotypes. And why is this disease so economically important? So SMDB is ranked among the most economically devastating animal diseases in the world due to direct losses, including loss of milk production, cart power, a growth retardation of affected animals, abortion in pregnant animals, and death in cows, piglets, and lambs but also a, a lot of indirect losses are attributed to the disruption of the trade of animal and their products. To give you some of examples of fairly recently or some old outbreaks, there was an outbreak in, in Taiwan in 1997. Taiwan had been free of the disease for over 50 years back then. And when they had the outbreak, they had to slaughter 38% of pig population. And only that cost like uh, the equivalent of $6 billion in loss. So the country would, um, would regain the free status. And then just by, sorry, the $6 billion just was bought by the slaughter campaign or something out campaign and then Adding to that all of the uh, money that had to be invested to regain the free status, total loss in U.S. dollars was $15 billion back in 1997. More recent outbreaks happened in Europe in 2001, involving uh, UK, Ireland, Ireland, France, and the Netherlands, and the losses in uh, in, with all of these uh, countries combined were estimated to be around $29 billion. And also, uh, SMD is now considered a biological weapon. And after terrorist attacks in, attacks in the U.S., the, a lot of plants were reestablished to, to sort of try to evaluate what would be the, the loss if the U.S would be attacked with uh, using this virus. And the estimation is that up to $100 billion a year could be lost in the livestock industry in the U.S. if it was affected by FMDB. So uh, this uh, virus and this disease uh, has a, a very wide host range. It can affect a any cloven hoofed animal, and uh, there's been some descriptions in elephants. So it can affect over 70 different species. There are three types of hosts in domestic livestock. We have sheep and goats, and they have been defined as, as being the maintenance group because they can get infected and shed, but they show little clinical disease. So it's difficult to diagnose. We have the pigs that are considered the amplifiers because they get infected and require much larger uh, infectious dose, but uh, once they become viremic, they shed a lot of virus. And then we have the cattle that are considered the indicator because they get easily infected and they show very clear clinical disease. So typically, it's this is a cattle is where the disease is identified first. So a virus, virus virulence determines, determines condition and host range. Most of SMDV strains infect all susceptible host species, but there have been this, several descriptions of some strains that infect either a swine or cattle, but not both. 
and that's also depending on the stereotype. So there are several publications talking about this uh, issue. So, for example, in in the 2000s, a stereotype O that they was described to only affect uh, pigs, or later on, uh, another description in 2005 with a panacea stereotype. And that's the topic that is really interested a lot of different scientific groups in the world. How is this disease transmitted? So the virus is present in the vesicular fluid at the site of erosions, as well as in the oropharynx, nasopharynx area. And that uh, is important because the virus can be transmitted by aerosol. So it could be by direct contact with the broken epithelial, epithelial uh, area where the vesiculars are present, or by in inhalation of drop droplets from the aerosol formation. And also important, the indirect contact through fomites. So, and different, like it's been described uh, that trucks can carry the virus on their tires for, for hundreds of miles from one place to another. And it's important to understand that the latent period is shorter than the incubation period. Um, and so this means that the virus is starting to be shed before the animals show clinical signs. And also, it's been described that vaccinated animals, when they are exposed to the virus and they are protected, they never develop the disease, they are still able to shed virus. So that complicates all of the uh, control strategies even more. So uh, it's important to understand what is the pathogenesis of the disease. So as I was saying before, when the animal is exposed to the virus, the virus enters through the upper respiratory tract or the oral tract. And it has a first a site of replication. In, in cattle, it's been described that the first a site of replication is the nasopharyngeal area, specifically the, the mucosal associated lymph. So the epithelium that is over the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue on the nasopharynx. And you can detect virus there as early as six hours after infection. Then, as you move to the viremic stage, the virus, you can find large amounts of virus in the lung. And, and there is, the architecture of the lung is preserved, but uh, there are a lot of cells uh, where the virus is replicating there, so then because of the lungs are part of the respiratory tract, of course, then the aerosol formation is important for transmission. So even at 24 hours, when the animals are not showing any uh, vesicular lesion, they already are spreading virus through the lungs. And then the generalization of the disease occurs typically 24 hours after infection. So when we uh, talk about the this pathogenesis of FMD, we always talk about the pre stage, viremic stage, and post viremic stage. If you look at the at this graph in the bottom of the slide, you can see the purple shaded area is uh, the time when the animals start to show clinical signs. And as you see here, as um, they don't show clinical signs until 40 to 48 hours after being exposed to the virus. However, the animals uh, develop viremia starting at 22, 24 hours post-infection. Post and if you see in the nasal swab, you can detect virus as early as five hours uh, post-exposure. 
So the initial peak here that you see in this um, in this graph represents the virus the virus that was being intake by the animal. This so the the uh, the um, X as is going by hours. So the animal was exposed at hour zero and through all the way through the third hour after exposure, you still can detect virus that was the originally uh, inoculum and then that disappears and then the, the animals start shedding virus as early as six hours. And then uh, another uh, representation of of the pathogenesis, um, we we on Plum Island have run some infectiousness studies this this time in pigs, representing very similar results of what I just presented for cattle. So in these particular studies, the animals were exposed to the virus and then animals were being sampled or euthanized at different days post uh, exposure or were actually exposed to other naive animals as dif at different times post exposure. And if you look at this slide, what is very striking is that even in pigs where they are considered not so is sensitive to the disease as early as 24 hours after or one day after exposure, the animals are infectious. So naive animals that are in contact with exposed animals 24 hours after initial inoculation get sick. And they also the other important part is even in the other side of the, of the time range, late at day 8, 9, 10, 11, when the animals are already healing, they are starting to recover from the disease, they are still infectious. And um, between day 11 and 15, they, we are considered that the end of infectiousness period. This is really important to have under consideration in case of an outbreak because uh, these parameters have to be seriously considered when you are doing epi epidemi epidemiological simulations of outbreaks. Before, we used to think that the animals were only infectious when they had ongoing vesicular lesions. Now we realize that this window of transmission is much bigger than previously considered, so that um, those parameters have to be included in, in, in simulation studies to be able to design preparedness plans in case of an outbreak. So in, in terms of the disease, it's important, as I explained before, that not all of the species behave the same. Also for transmission, so cattle are highly susceptible that's why they are considered the indicators. And um, they can take up to 10,000 more times of virus to be infected by the oral route than by the, uh, the aerosol route. And they can shed in the milk, feces, urine, semen, saliva. And the peak uh, of clinical signs occur with the peak of viremia. A swine required a significantly larger dose than cattle for the aerosol spread, like 600 times more of virus to be infected by aerosol. However, they are more uh, sensitive to con direct contact transmission. Uh, and that's important to understand because typically the ticks are more socially interactive between them. Um, so I guess probably the virus is taking advantage of that situation and in the case of the pigs is using that route to be more uh, infectious. And also some studies have demonstrated in particular in pigs that uh, transmission effectiveness is different depending on the 
FMDV serotypes. In one particular study performed on Plum Island, um, animals were exposed to different virus at different times, and it was demonstrated that, for example, the A24 crusader was very infectious even when the animals were commingled together for four hours only. However, for other serotypes like O1 Manis Manisa and Asia, one Shamir, the animals needed to be in contact for longer time in order to have an effective transmission between them. And then finally, we have sheep and goats who are highly susceptible to infection through aerosol as similar to, to cattle, even though they have a, a lower respiratory volume. And then they are also highly susceptible to contact a challenge and also indirect selling through fomites and, um, and ingestion. Uh, Intra-herd infectivity can vary and also it depends on the strain and the breed involved in the outbreak. And then another very important aspect of FMD pathogenesis is the carrier state. So, um, it's been described that ruminants, especially cattle, can become carriers of the disease. So even if they, they become sick, they recover, I think they can still uh, spread virus for long periods of time. So it's been some a literature description talking about uh, five years for African buffalo, 3.5 years for cattle, and also nine months for sheep and four months for goats. This situation has never been described for swine, and although there have been great efforts to try to reproduce this situation in a um, scientific uh, control uh, experiments for, for pigs, it has never been able to be reproduced. What is the importance of the carrier state? It's very important because even vaccinated animals that never get sick, never show clinical signs, can become carriers and could potentially spread the disease to uh, other cohorts, even though they are not showing any clinical signs. What are the clinical signs of foot and mouth disease? This is, as I said before, it's a very infectious uh, virus, so it's a high morbidity but very low mortality. The animals go through a period of fever, anorexia and depression re related to the fever, lameness because they, the fecules are forming in their feet, and salivation, especially for cattle, because they develop big vesicles in the tongue and mouth area. What you see macroscopically is the blanching of the coronary bands or the tongue and, and lips and gums and the vesicles or erosions around the coronary bands, the interdigital space, tongues, mouth, oral mucous membranes and teeth in the case of cattle. So basically um, what you see is a vesicular disease. This is all you can detect when, when you are looking at an animal. And then sometimes there are some uh, animals that suffer sudden deaths, and when you run necropsies in these animals, they typically have developed a myocardial damage or what's called tiger heart, heart because of the, how the heart appears macroscopically. And uh, this situation happens more often in piglets, or young animals, mostly piglets, but also in cows. So it's very important to understand that this is a vesicular disease and there is not any taxonomic lesion that you could detect macroscopically to be able to be certain that this is foot and mouth disease. So I'm going to show you some uh, some pictures of the different species. As you see, first in cattle, one of the main clinical signs that 
people can detect is salivation. And then when you look closer and if the disease is, is at early stages, you start noticing the vesicular form formation either around uh, in the snout area. Also very typical in the, in the interdigital space for cattle and you can also see teeth affected. So as you can see in this slide, there are two different stages of the disease. In the early stage, again, you see the blanching, you see the vesicle formation. In the later stage, once the vesicle has been disrupted, you see the erosion of the epithelial, the open wound, and sometimes it can be secondary infected. These pictures are on, in the mouth uh, area. But similarly, you can see the same thing when you look at the feet. So for cattle, it's more common the vesicle formation in the interdigital area in the feet. And at the beginning, you just see a blanching. And to be honest with you, when we run animal studies here, if it's the first time you are going through an animal study and you are very anxious to see if your animals are getting sick or not, at the beginning it's very difficult to identify um, because uh, sometimes you, you don't, you, the only thing you see is a blanching. When you, when you try to look closer, there is no liquid accumulated there yet. So you have to wait and see what happens with the vesicles and then with time, 99% of the time, the vesicles get disrupted, and you see an image more like you see in the right side of this slide with the open one. And then for the swine, it's similar. Um, at the beginning, again, you see the small vesicles, blanching of the coronary bands, the foot pads, you will see blanch, uh, um, like very wet foot pads. And then as the disease progresses, the, the vesicles open and uh, pigs could also lose the entire hoof because of the vesicle taking the entire toe. And also in swine, uh, lesions in the, in the mouth are not so common. Sometimes you see small vesicles in the tongue, it never gets so spread in the tongue like you see in cattle. And sometimes you see also small lesions in the lip, but it's more common on top of the snout. And then for sheep and goats, it's very rare to be able to identify vesicular lesions because they don't show much clinical signs. Sometimes in the, in the gum area, more typically observed in the interdigital space, similar to what is seen in cattle. And when you when you do the necropsy, sometimes you see in the in the stomach pillars you see some erosion or ruptured vesicles. And when there is sudden death of the animals, you look at the heart and you see the myocarditis or a tiger heart, tiger stripping. And, and many times you see this sudden death even before the animals have developed vesicles. So as I have been mentioning and making my effort for you to understand that this disease is a vesicular disease. So there are many other diseases that look exactly the same as foot and mouth disease, including trauma and um, toxicities developed by intake of plants or things like that. So I have prepared this slide so you have an idea of what are the different uh, differential diagnoses that could be done by species. So in the case of swine we have this, and cattle, we have vesicular stomatitis, a malignant cataract fever also for sheep and goats. For swine we, ha we have now Seneca virus, which is very important in our country right now, swine vesicular disease. 
uh, DSD, and then for cattle we have also blue tongue, parapox, DVDB, and for sheep and goats we have also PPR or pest of petite ruminants, parapox, and sheep and goat pox. So I'm going to show you uh, some slides now of different pictures. The first slide is going to be without a diagnose, and then I'm going to let you like five seconds to think about what do you think it could be, and then I'll give you the answer. And I have grouped this among species. So here we have a, the snout of the pig that is heavily affected by a vesicle standing throughout the whole snout. And this case, it was Seneca virus. This case, we see the hoof of a pig that is about to lose some of the <laughs> hooves because it's heavily affected. It's in the late stage of vesicular disruption. In this case, this was foot and mouth disease. Again, another pig that has a small vesicle in the snout, but big blanching areas in the coronary bands of several limbs. And this was swine vesicular disease. Similar pictures of hooves in the pigs. Some of the vesicles are not disrupted, some are. This was again Seneca virus. Oops, this already, I already told you this was BESV or vesicular exanthema of the swine. And again, what you see is the blanching of the coronary band. Now we move to cattle. We see this animal with the, with the mucosa of the mouth heavily affected and looks like secondary infected. This was foot and mouth disease. Again, here you see in the tip of the tongue of this animal, small vesicle. This was vesicular stomatitis. And this animal has peeled off the entire snout. This is blue tongue. And you see here some small rounded lesions in the lip and gum area. This is bovine papular stomatitis. And another uh, picture of lesions in the, in the lips, gums, episodic hemorrhagic disease. And this is a picture of a goat with some lesions in the lips. This is or. So again, this is just to make an effort in you to understand that this is just what you see is vesicles in the animal, and you have to make sure that you collect the samples and send them for to the lab for diagnosis. And all of the effort that I have made to present you with the pathogenesis is important because it's important to understand what type of samples to be collected at the different stages of disease. Um, to be able to diagnose the, the disease. So early during the disease when, even before the animals uh, develop clinical signs, but during the bidemic period, you will be able to do viral detection by PCR or, or virus isolation. Then uh, another viral detection by PCR can be done in the uh, swab samples, but also in probanks even later once the animal is completely recovered. And that's very important to define the carrier stage, the Provan sample. And then uh, you can also run ELISA to detect antigen and uh, also for the detection of antibodies later on. So 
as a general rule, uh, what samples should you be taking? If you see an animal with a vesicular lesion, please try to get a vesicular flap and put that in a TV, TV media. If you can collect, if the vesicle is still uh, not disrupted and you are able to collect vesicular fluid, that would be the best source of virus that you could get from the animal. And again, if you collect the vesicular fluid, put it with TV, TV media. And then if you could not collect the vesicular fluid or tissue, you can still try to get a swab from a affected area. And um, again, uh, yes, please, in all of these cases, please label your tubes. And then you can also get serum samples to detect viremias and uh, also get other purple top samples to, to do differential diagnosis with other virus diseases like blue tongue. And finally, the oropharyngeal uh, probank is important, especially to uh, diagnose animals in the current stage. Uh, and then what do we do with the samples? When you collect tissue swab, vesicular fluid, we are going to run PCR and also we are going to put them in cell culture for virus isolation. Serum samples could also be used for viral detection, but they typically are used for uh, to run ELISAs or a guard gel immunodiffusion uh, test. And then in highly suspect cases, they will do antigen ELISA for serotype determination and then sequencing to corroborate the, the serotype affecting the area. And finally, uh, I would like to talk to you a little bit about what are the control strategies for FMD. And these are uh, two very distinct scenarios depending on whether the disease is happening in endemic countries or in FMD-free countries. So as I explained before, endemic countries run through vaccination campaigns. Uh, animals are vaccinated uh, every six months. Typically with a multivalent uh, whole, uh, DEI in, whole virus DEI inactivated vaccine. Of course, because it's an inactivated vaccine, it needs the the conjugation with adjuvants to be able to induce a protective immune response. And there are different types of adjuvants uh, commercially available, and different regions of the world prefer to use one versus the other, and also depending on the target species for vaccination. Most of the time, uh, cattle is the only uh, species vaccinated, but in some countries, like in in Korea, they also vaccinate pigs. And then, what is the other scenario uh, that's more related to what is our situation in the U.S. and that is what happens in FMD-free countries? So when an outbreak is detected in a free country, the first thing it happens is that there is a, a animal movement control, and then a, they will start doing a stamping out of the affected areas in like in ring uh, a, in the ring a situation a, depending on the affected area. Of course, a disposal of the carcasses, sanitation of livestock and all affected locations. This is a reportable disease, so it has to be immediately reported to the OIE. And more recently, a vaccination has been an important topic to discuss whether vaccination is used to control a disease spread in SMD free countries or not. So in that sense, there they are many discussions among experts and scientists about what is the best solution for the problem in case of an outbreak. And they are 
three different uh, possible solutions. The first one would be to run stamping out only without vaccination. And if the country decides to go for that route, it will be able to gain uh, FMD free status early, only three months after the last uh, old animal has been disposed. But the stamp a stamping out campaign has to be very thorough and a lot of animals have to be euthanized. So this uh, is very expensive for a country to assume. The other situation is a, a run vaccination campaigns to try to control the outbreak as quick as possible, but then retain the animals. So this is economically manageable during the, the outbreak and the vaccination campaign. But uh, you, you have to also consider what is the cost of losing the, the trade losses when you cannot export your products. And then when you decide to go with that route, vaccination and retain, the OIE requires at least six months after the detection of the last case before the country can regain FMD free status. So during that time, the country would not be able to trade with any animal product. And then the other situation, the third scenario would be vaccine and remove, which means that you use vaccination during the outbreak to control the spread of the out outbreak, but you will also uh, euthanize all affected and vaccinated animals at the end of the outbreak. So this has been a, a preferred way of acting recently, and it's been demonstrated that when you vaccinate during an outbreak, you can significantly reduce the size of the outbreak. And, um, and then you can regain FMD free status three months after your last uh, surveillance. So then you also don't have to add up so much a uh, a loss related to to the impossibility of of trade with your animals and animal products. But the overall decision on each country, each situation would have to be taken in the moment where the outbreak happens and it's very important to have under consideration that depending on how large the export livestock industries are in the country versus uh, not having that situation. There are several uh, scientific manuscripts uh, uh, written uh, showing different circumstances and, and calculations with simulations of different studies. And it's very difficult to come up with the only best option to act really depending on each country and each situation and how how quickly the outbreak is being diagnosed and managed. So, um, of course, I mentioned that in endemic countries, they use the BEI inactivated vaccine. This is the only commercial vaccine available now. Um, but this vaccine has many, many flaws, although it's still effective and um, it was used to eradicate the disease from many parts of the world, it still can be improved because um, as part of an ideal vaccine or biotherapeutic treatment, there are many things that are missing in the uh, current commercially available vaccine. And then as a um, for FMD V control strategies, there are many groups in the world making great efforts to improve the, the commercially available vaccine. In fact, uh, we at Plum Island have a very strong group working on developing new vaccine candidates, and we have developed a, a vector-based vaccine in which we use an adeno replication defective adenovirus to express the FMD capsid, 
and uh, this product has been uh, developed already, and we have a, a license by the CDB to use the, this vaccine in case of an emergency situation in cattle. Then another platform that we are currently working with is the use of a inactivated vaccine similar to the commercially available, but this is a more uh, attenuated virus, so it's safer to produce. And in fact, this vaccine candidate has been removed from the tier one select agent list, so it can be produced in the U.S. mainland. And so Aegis, which is, which is the veterinary uh, branch of Pfizer, it's working with us to develop a, a vaccine production plan using this leaderless uh, inactivated vaccine. And then there are many other different platforms, including the use of biotherapeutics to rapidly control the, the disease in case of an outbreak before even the, the vaccine is able to protect the animals. So those would be um, some considerations in, once this has been fully developed to be able to treat the animals with uh, biotherapeutics in particular, in particularly interferon to really uh, um, control disease spread and outbreak before uh, the animals can develop immune uh, response against vaccines. And this brings me to the end of my talk, and I would take any questions. And we have a bunch of questions in our chat. Um, the first question is, is this transmitted through grain? I'm yes. assuming I mean FMD. Yes. It, it can be transmitted through food. And actually, this is a great question because this virus is very sensitive to pH, so technically, if the, the, the food is being brought to the stomach, the virus would be immediately inactivated once it reached to the stomach. But before getting there, um, the virus is going through the, the oropharynx, and this is the primary site of replication of the virus. So food uh, can transmit the disease, and there are actually studies ongoing here on Plum Island with pigs to demonstrate that that's a possible source of transmission? And the answer is yes. How much do insects play a part of transmission? It's insignificant. It would be part okay. of the fomites group, but not, they don't, they are not reservoirs, they don't play a role. This is not a vector worm disease. The next question is, has there been a documented transmission from a vaccinated animal that has been recognized as a carrier? This person says, I've heard statements like, while this is theoretically possible, it actually doesn't happen or hasn't been established as a real epi risk in contributing to the spread. And that's totally correct. Um, the significance of the carrier state, it's basically theoretical. And especially for vaccinated animals, but uh, some recent studies um, run with uh, researchers from Plum Island in collaboration with researchers from the Netherlands have demonstrated that in a carrier state that is completely clean from the disease, if you take a Brovan sample and that sample has virus, infectious virus in it, and you immediately infect another animal, through the nasopharyngeal route, that animal can get sick. However, this is a very artificial uh, study. That's how important is that in the field? There are many other studies that where they try to put um, proven positive animals next to naive animals, immune depress the proven positive animals, and do different things to be able to see if there was transmission and it was never been able to be demonstrated. 
Okay. How many days does it usually take for the vesicles to break? And does the environment, such as moist, gravel, et cetera, influence how quickly the vesicles break? Yes. They, they can break very quickly. And, um, I mean, here, when we run studies, we, we inspect the animals very thoroughly and every day, sometimes a couple of times a day. And uh, in our control situation, they, the vesicles can start disrupting in, in within 24 hours. But again, we, we, once we challenge or we inoculate the animals with a virulent strain, we look at the animals every day. So we really see the whole progression of the vesicle. What happens in the fields, I would assume, is the same thing. Okay, the next question is, please explain more about how vaccinated animals shed virus, and does this happen when they become infected? and clinical signs are masked. So vaccinated animals uh, can either be protected or not, but when they are protected, they never develop clinical signs and they still can share virus uh, in the, through the aerosol. Um, there are several manuscripts from one of the, the pathology group here trying to define um, different days. And um, I'm not sure the exact answer, but I could uh, send you the name of the PI and uh, I, you can look for papers, but yeah, I don't know exact answer, but it, it happens even though they don't develop clinical signs. How early after they have been exposed, I'm not sure about that. And we'll, we'll have these questions and I'll get those to you so we can also address that and we can get this to the person who asked this question. Um, yes. What is the cause of the carrier state and what factors may impact the occurrence of carrier state during a vaccination campaign? So the cost of the carrier state is, is is basically the ability to gain FMD-free status. So in an endemic area, if they are trying to eradicate the disease, they will have to have negative, negative tests in all of the tested animals when they collect proban. Pro so as long as they have a positive proban animal, they won't, wouldn't be able to get the FMD-free status. Um, if you are not trying to regain that, it's just um, theoretical what is the cost because you still have to do your vaccination campaign, so the cost is already on the table, so it's really not much. But when you are trying to regain the FMD free status, it's very important. Okay. Can you ask if pulling of samples are allowed? Mm, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. That would be an a, be a an fatal question. Yeah, a fatal question. Yeah. We can bring that up. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it, not that I, you know, work at battle, but I'm so involved with the courses and everything. I don't think they would want you to pull samples. Um, you know, we do that in, in avian stuff, but I, I, I will check with them and I will get back to this person. Mm -hmm. um, with the vaccinate and remove strategy, is vaccination followed by movement to slaughter channels a possibility? No. You have to vaccinate and, and remove in place. So you are not allowed to move the animals around, no. Okay. If there is an outbreak on a farm or ranch and the cattle are watered on a pond or a spring, how do or would you need to treat the water? Uh, water, water is not considered a way of transmission, so virus is not going to survive there. So I don't think you need to treat the water. Okay. The next question is, what is meant by a leaderless vaccine? Yes, <laughs> very good question. So leader is one of the proteins of the virus. 
and it's called leader because it's the first one that is uh, transcribed and it, it causes several things in, at the cellular level that allows the virus to replicate and not being uh, attacked by the cellular immune system. So uh, it has been demonstrated that you can generate the virus without that protein and because that protein is not present the virus is greatly attenuated, but still is able to replicate. So you are able to grow that in a particular cellular type that is more permissive for viruses. So once you have the virus being able to replicate, you can manufacture that, but it's safer because this virus, if you inoculated life in an animal, it's not going to cause disease. So it's still used as inactivated vaccine because it's, it's trying to overcome the, 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 the market from the current BI inactivated vaccine, but it's very safe to produce because you are not going to cause outbreaks because of production. And you have to have in mind, I don't know if I mentioned that, but an outbreak that happened in UK in 2007 occurred because the virus escaped from a vaccine manufacturer facility. So having this new platform with the leaderless virus would completely avoid that possibility. This virus would not cause an outbreak if escaped from the facility. So it's a, it's a, a very important advancement in vaccine, vaccinology for food and mouth disease. Okay, the next question is, vaccinated animals have been demonstrated to be carriers. So do wildlife slash native animals play a significant role in maintenance or transmission? Yeah, yeah. So um, when they, there are several studies studying the, the carrier state in endemic countries, especially in Africa and India, and they sample a some of the water buffalo and other wild species, and they they actually can detect the virus there, even though the animals are not sick. In this case, wildlife is not vaccinated, right? Because they don't they are not included in the vaccinated campaign. So, the next comment question is: Since this affects the repository, have they looked at it for COVID? Can you repeat that, please? It says, since this affects the repository, have they looked at it for COVID? Not sure what that means. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. We, well, all I can tell is we are not allowed to work with COVID in Plum Island, and the bio repository right. wouldn't be affected by that. Okay. How can virus be inactivated in milk bulk tanks? and manure pits? You just have to uh, lower the pH at one, at one point or okay. increase the temperature. Virus is very sensitive to pH or temperature, so just by boiling the milk, you would be inactivating it. Okay. Is 1.5% to 3% a reasonable estimate for mortality in cattle? Mm, I think that's very high. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, do the animals infected have to be euthanized or can they recover fully? No, they recover mm -hmm. fully. Yeah. yeah. They, they don't, it's very, I mean, here on Plum Island, under scientific uh, circumstances and, and because we have to have a great consideration for animal welfare. We have some parameters in which this is a go, no go. Once the disease, sometimes it gets too severe and the animals are euthanized. Like for example, if the animal loses a hoof, the animal is euthanized. But if it's not euthanized, that animal is going to recover. It's going to be in a lot of pain for some time, but it will recover. So 
can shedding of virus just happen with breathing, or can it be by droplet only, such as from a cough or a sneeze? Can you repeat that, please? It says, can shedding of virus just happen with breathing, or can it by droplet, such as from a cough or a sneeze? It can happen with both. So it goes now that because of COVID, we talk about big droplets, small droplets. It can go in both in this case. Okay. Um, okay. Is fecal matter waste a transmission worry? And if so, how high is it? And how do you dispose of it? Uh, yeah, I don't know how high it is a matter. And so then if, if you had an outbreak, you would have to basically burn everything, including the fecal matter. So the other question was, there was a question about a repository, and this person wrote back, the repository, since this affects I'm sorry, affects respiratory. Has anyone looked at the vaccine for COVID? I, but we don't work with that. No. And, yeah. No. Okay. And does herd size matter in impact or transmission? Does herd size matter in impact to transmission or herds catching the virus? For transmission, yes, it's very important. I mean, I mean, right. Yeah, density of the herd, how close they are, that's very important for transmission, yes. Okay, do we have any other questions from the folks that are still on the line? We had a lot of really good um, comments, uh, Fina, fantastic presentation and great answers. Um, people really appreciate you presenting this today, as do I. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, no, I really thank you for doing this. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we do have another webinar tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to be talking about um, African horse sickness. So hope you can join us. And uh, so have a great afternoon. And thanks, Fina. Thank you so much. Send me the questions to see if I, I can will. address. Okay. Thank you so much. Definitely. Thank you, everyone. Bye. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Services. You may not disconnect.